Hi, and welcome to Mondays with Marlo. I'm very excited to have Susie Orman with us again today. We love her. Well, obviously you love her because she's breaking records today. She's First of all, she's our first three-peat guest. And second, we've got more questions this weekend for her than we've ever had even for her before. No other guest has ever had this many questions. So people need you, Susie. I like you know, them. Because, you know, I'm sitting here, everybody, thinking to myself, <laughs> what records are we breaking? <laughs> I'm like, oh, oh, now we know. People need you, especially now. I mean, we're, we're coming off the holidays. We're coming mm -hmm. into tax season. People are sending their kids to college. Mm -hmm. And then you just came up with something called the approved credit, which we'll talk about later. Yeah, yeah. And, and you've got so many things going on. But I want to get to the questions. Because let's do it. There's so I, many. Yeah, there's that's so my many. favorite thing to do. Answer your questions. That's right. So that's, let's do that. That's why that. we love you. Yeah. This is from Grace. She says, I make 65000 a year. I live in New York State. I live alone and I'm 34. Can you tell me what to claim on my taxes? Mm -hmm. Some people say one exemption. Some say two. What are the pros and cons of either one? All right. So here's what you need to know. I can't exactly tell you, Grace, because I don't know what else you have going on in your life, but I'll tell you who can tell you. Go to irs.gov, and there you will find a place where you can actually put in the information, and it will tell you how many exemptions to claim. Just for people, if they don't know what we're talking about, the more exemptions you, play, you claim, the less they withhold from your paycheck. Uh -huh. The less exemptions that you claim, the more they withhold from your paycheck. Right. Now, you would know if they're holding too much from your paycheck, if at, at the end of the year, after you've done your taxes, you get a tax refund. If you're getting a tax refund, you, have, you should be able to claim more exemptions because you don't want to get a tax refund. Why? The reason you don't want to get a tax refund is that they're holding your money and they're not paying you any interest oh, on I it. Oh, I see. Yeah, so yeah. If you, the average refund is $3,000 a year. Right. So if you could get an extra $250 a month right now in your paycheck, right. that money could go to pay off your credit card right, debt. Right. That money could go where to fund your retirement account. Right. So you want your money. You don't want you, Uncle you, Sam to right. hold it. You want oh, it when you can get you, it. Grace. That's great. This is from Dorothy <laughs> Day Hornsby. Is it best to use a professional to do our taxes versus doing it ourselves? Depends how complicated your taxes happen to be. I, of course, have to use a professional. I don't understand anything they're doing. But if all you're doing is you're working, you get a paycheck. You own one home. You don't have a business. Your life is simple. Oh, please, just go online and do your taxes yourself <laughs> if you're good with that. You know, you have H&R Block. You have TurboTax. Don't you think that the professionals just use their own version of that program? Give it a try. But here's what I would really do, just so you know you're doing it right. Do your taxes yourself. Then go to see a professional. Oh, great idea. And see. She's so smart. You see, and then you'll know if you're capable to do yes. it yourself. And then next year, do it yourself. That's great. Yeah. That's great. That's a real fallback. That's great. I like that. That's this is, good. This is from Lanny Roth. Hi, Susie. Even though I told myself I wouldn't, I spent about a thousand, thousand, yeah, one thousand over the holidays between gifts, traveling, parties, etc. I'm usually good about paying off debt, but I'm going to have a hard time paying this off when my credit card comes. What do you recommend for paying off holiday debt and controlling the situation for the next holiday season? Okay, so Lanny, here's what I really want you to do. I want you to write down right now, right here, right now, how you are feeling. What does it feel like to have debt that you didn't have to have? Does it feel that it's humiliating? It feels like bondage. Does it feel like this part? You write it down and you keep that in your wallet. You paste it on your credit card if you have to. So next year, before you go and you spend money again, you can simply look at it and go, I don't want to feel like that. Oh, I great. don't have to do this. But how do you get out of that debt? Simple. When the credit card comes in with the $1,000 on it, Rather than just paying the minimum payment due that they're going to require you to pay, whatever the minimum payment due is, triple it. So if they tell you you only have to pay $30 this month, pay $90. If next month they only tell you you have to pay $20, pay $80. If you continue to triple it or you do something like that, then you'll be out of debt before you know it. If you only pay the minimum payment due, you can be in debt for years right. and years that's, to come. That's great. That is very good <coughs> advice. This is from Mary Lapointe Daggle. When does Medicare kick in? What age is it now? 65. Uh huh. Okay, that was fast. This is from Catherine Menges. Considering the economy, how do you know when it is the right time to start a business? It's the right time to start a business not based on the economy. It's a right time to start a business when you are capable of doing a business, no matter what economy it is, it will be successful. Because even if you start a business in a good economy, 
if a bad economy starts, now you're going to lose your business anyway. Right. So do you have working capital? Do you have experience? Do you know what you're doing? Do you have a whole year behind you that if not one person walked into your business or used your business, you'd still be able to stay afloat? So it isn't about the economy that's going to make your business. It's about you making your business strong regardless of the economy that's out there. Oh, that's great. That's great. I like this. Oh, we are so darn we, smart. We should have a little clock and see how many questions can we answer in the time. And then we'll, we should just we'll go know. bam, 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 next she'll time. She'll know. She'll know. For the fourth time. This is Brooke DeSalvo. Is there a way to start paying off student loans before you graduate? Sure. What you should be doing is wondering, number one, are they subsidized student loans, which means while you're in college, there is no interest rate accruing, or are they unsubsidized loans? Now, chances are you probably have both. Unsubsidized loans mean that while you're in college, even though you don't have to make the payment to pay them back, the interest rate is accruing, so your loan is accruing. Mm -hmm. Find out, number one, which ones do you have? Chances are, like I said, you have both. You can pay the interest on your unsubsidized so that when you graduate, you're only going to be paying what you borrowed and not the interest. So call your lender and they'll make arrangements for you to be able to do this that. This is very much on people's minds. Here's another one from John Blaine. Yep. Hi, John. Welcome. Susie, are student loans good debt or bad debt? Is there such a thing as an ideal student loan debt situation to be in? Yes. An ideal student loan situation to be in is this. You have done your homework. And you know that after you graduate, your job is that you want to be, your career, is going to pay you, let's just say, $50,000 a year. After taxes, you know you're going to bring home maybe $30,000 a year. That gives you $2,500 per month. You know that your rent is $600 a month, your car payment, your food, everything. When you know all of that, what's ever left, let's say there's $200 left, that is the ideal amount that should go to what? Your student loan. So you should work this backwards and not have a student loan that is larger than what $200 a month in this situation will pay. So it's not, oh, any student loan is great. It's what will your job and your living costs after taxes allow you to pay back in terms of a student loan. Do not borrow more than that. Oh, that's great. That's great. Oh, I hope that you can still do that. <laughs> Leanne Linson Slosser. Susie, can you make a game plan for the divorced woman who never had control and is relearning the financial world? I have plenty of funds, but I don't know how to invest them the wisest. Woman never let a man take full control. Oh, Leanne, you know, what's funny is that you have far more ability than you have any idea. Mm -hmm. You navigated a divorce. Maybe you navigated having children. Who knows? But I can tell you, most women, we're the ones, you know, there's a saying in China that women hold up half the sky. Uh -huh. In the United States of America, I think women hold up the entire sky. <laughs> I just do. Men are lucky that they get to walk under our umbrellas, but then I would think that. So you have to understand, you just have to start little by little and knowing what to do. Now, I happen to have a newsletter called The Money Navigator. In The Money Navigator, it breaks down exactly what you should invest in according to your age, exchange traded funds, and everything. If you go on your website, we'll come up with a passcode that allows oh, everybody great. who is watching this today, or when they watch it, what? to download that newsletter oh, for free for one full year. Oh, that'd be that great. way, you'll start to get an idea. It talks about real estate. It talks about gold. Just start getting yourself familiar with this before right. you do anything so you can feel right. what it's like. Yes. So we'll give that to no, them. That'd be great. That's great. That's a gift we're getting. I'm so excited. Yeah. Just for us. Wonderful. But I think it's pretty great that she has plenty of funds. You well, don't see that sentence often. Here's here. what I'm afraid of. She has plenty of funds because during the divorce, she got half of her husband's funds. Right. So she wasn't responsible for earning those funds. I see. And now she has plenty of these funds, and because she didn't earn them, Marlo, uh -huh. she is afraid that she's going to lose them. That's right. So even though it's wonderful that you have that money, understand you're capable of dealing with it. Don't think just because you got it from him that it means you don't know what to do. We're going to educate you. That's you just great. stick with us here. This is from Cooper. Hi, Susie. My job doesn't offer a 401k or any retirement packages at all. What is the best way to invest money on my own in retirement packages and anything else? Yeah, the best thing, and you know, Marla, I talk about this all the time since we've been doing this. What kind of retirement account do I love? Come on, do you remember? No. <laughs> 401k? You, no. no. I love a Roth IRA. Oh, I don't know that. I love Roth 
IRAs. So look into a Roth IRA. Best thing you can do under under 50, you could put up to $5,000 a year, 50 or older, $6,000 a year. A Roth IRA is funded with after-tax contributions, money you have already paid taxes on. Why do I love that? Because let's say you put in 5,000 this year, 5,000 next year, 5,000 the year after that. You're 35. Don't you wish? Yes. I, uh, well, I kind of don't. I, I don't want to be 35 again. Would you? <laughs> I just want to live a longer time. Yeah, that, there we go. All <laughs> That's all I care about. So, so now you're 35, you start this. Now you're 38. You have $15,000 that you put in there. Now it's grown to 16000 and you get in trouble. You can take anything up to the $15,000 you put in without taxes or penalties whatsoever. Okay. It's simply the $1,000 of growth that has to stay in there till you're 59 and a half and for five years. Your account has to be open for at least five years. But if you don't need that money, and now that money grows and grows and grows, when you're older and you go to take it out, you get to take it out tax-free. You don't need to take it out. You can leave it in there for as long as you want. You die with it. Now it goes down to your beneficiaries, and when they take it out, it's tax-free. With wow. a 401k plan, remember, when you take it out, totally taxable to you as ordinary income. You cannot withdraw it any way you want until you're 59 and a half years of age. You have to start making withdrawals when you're 70 and a half, so the Roth IRA is a far better way to so go. So how do you get to the Roth IRA? All you have to do is go to any brokerage firm, uh -huh. and you bank, anything, but I don't like bank. I don't like insurance companies. If you're going to open up a Roth IRA, do it with a discount brokerage firm. They're all good. I don't care which one you use. Good. But just make sure that that's how you do it. There you go. And you'll be able to use the Money Navigator, too, because that will tell you what to invest in within your Roth IRA. We're good. getting everything here. This is one, one, We're stop, one stop, stop shopping. Going. This is from Francie Dumont. Marlo, please ask Susie where an American can hide their money. What country is the best? I made a lot of good investments. I don't want anything of mine seized by the government. I hear if the country goes belly up, this can happen. Is this true? I have all of Susie's books and I admire you. Are you kidding me, girlfriend? I don't know, Francie, who told you that if the country goes belly up, they can seize all your money. But I'm here to tell you that the country's not going to go belly up. You don't have to worry about it. So don't go thinking you have to hide all your money. That is absolutely ridiculous. Doesn't mean that we're not in trouble doesn't mean that it's easy here, but we are nowhere even close to this entire country going belly up. Just make sure that any bank that you have your money in, that you, it's insured for $250,000 and you don't have much more than that in a bank. Use credit unions, again, that are NCUA insured. Just make sure everywhere that you put your money, there's insurance by either FDIC or NCUA and you'll be fine, sweetheart. Don't worry about it. Oh, that's, ins that's insuring now. My gosh. This is from Patty Burris Kurtz Dickinson. What do you think? How many names? Do, what do you say. think? Is she married three I, I, times? I guess, and she liked them all. I guess right <laughs> now. If it comes down to only enough money to pay one, what do you pay? Pay student loans or charge card bills? You absolutely pay student loans. I don't even have to think twice about that. In 99.999% of the circumstances, a student loan is not dischargeable in bankruptcy. Oh. So if you decide you can't pay your student loans, they are so great to you, they let you defer them. They let it and make it fine that you don't have to pay them. But interest is accumulating. Uh -huh. So 35000 turns into 70000 70000 turns into 140000 and then they come knocking at your door because you have got to pay it. And $140,000 of student loans is like $1,500 a month. Oh, and what happens if you don't pay your charge card bill? So if you don't pay your charge card, and let's say you're in trouble, all right, so what are they going to do? It's not secured with anything. If they want, they can sue you, but chances are they're not going to because uh -huh. you probably didn't owe them that much. But you could always claim bankruptcy on credit cards, charge card, lo you know, car loans, home loans, even oh, the right. IRS. Oh, really? But you cannot claim bankruptcy on student loans. Okay. So don't mess with your student loans. Do you hear me? We had, we had a bet on my staff and I lost. Why does that not surprise me? <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, I never had a student loan. So That's right. That. Uh, this is from Nellie. I trusted my boss's accountant as well as the payroll company to take the right amount of taxes out of my paycheck. I just found out now that she forgot to take out New York City taxes all year. Is there anything I can do? She forgot? Your boss's accountant forgot? That would say to me, you better check everything about your paychecks. You better check everything because how do you forget? to pay taxes. You don't just forget to pay taxes, people, especially if you're an accountant. That's like just, I don't even know, that's like, I don't know, that's like you're forgetting to eat for a whole year. <laughs> I don't think you can do that. 
So therefore, there really isn't a lot that you can do except pay the taxes. Now, there's usually a penalty. You have to pay in quarterly payments or every single month, however you do it, either 100% of this year's tax liability or 90% of what last year's tax liability will be. And you need to do it by the end of the year last year. So there might be a penalty here for you. You make sure you get your own account and you make sure somebody comes to step up for you. If you are charged penalties or whatever, you might ask this woman to pay for them. You do have something to go after her worth, but it's kind of hard because she's your boss's accountant. But your boss, I don't know. Why do I not like that? Why don't you like, I don't like this one, do I? Not at all. No, I don't. Uh, but I'm wondering, you know, th this is a, a good warning. Yes. Maybe if you're going to have somebody else do, taking out the right amount of taxes of your paycheck, maybe you have to go to that boss's accountant and say, just let me understand now what's going to come out of my paycheck. And what's it coming from. Yeah. For? And if anything, you should at least look at the money that's coming out. Yes. You shouldn't just get your paycheck, take the top off of it, and, and then just deposit it. You need to look, are they taking out FICA, are they taking right. out federal, are they taking out state? You need to check that. Right. And if you had, you would have seen nothing was coming right. out for state. Yeah, you, you really need to do that. Or do they take it out and put it somewhere else? I have to tell you, there's something about this I really, right. really right. don't right. like. I don't know why, but I just don't. And she said it's also the payroll company. So the payroll Yeah, company. I don't like it. The payroll company, everything's automated. I don't like it, just so you okay. know. Okay, all mm -hmm. right. You should get to the bottom of it. Mm -hmm. Janetta Mohan. Susie, should I refinance my house since the interest rates are so low? My current mortgage interest rate is 5.5, and I owe 148K and only about 5K in equity. I'm 30 years old, stable government job, no credit card debt, paid off all my student loans, and have a car payment of 10000 Susie, what should I do? So the question is, should he refinance the house? Yeah, Janetta, here's the problem. You can't refinance the house. Because you said that you only have $5,000 of equity in the house. If you owe $148,000, and let's say the house, you know, and you have $5,000 of equity in it, that means the house is worth really $153,000. You know, it's, it's worth just a little bit more. So you, to be able to refinance, would have needed at least twenty or $30,000 of equity in there. So when you refinance, there was 20% to do so. So this one's simple. You don't have enough equity. You don't have cash. You shouldn't do this. So you should just do nothing and be happy that all your pain is 5.5%. Right, exactly. Yeah. This is Donna Fields. Hi, Donna. Welcome. I'm retired with a pension and Social Security. How much of an emergency fund do I need if I have retirement investment accounts? You, oh, you're retired with a pension and Social Security. So, Donna, if you believe that your pension is secure, not all pensions are secure, I'm sorry to say, but if your pension is secure, Social Security is secure, and you're able to live within the means of those two checks coming in every month, and you have, event, you have other retirement investment accounts, you don't really need that big of an emergency fund at all, girlfriend, because nothing can happen if, the, the, you know, if that money stops. If you're working for it and you get sick, and you can't have that money coming in, now you need an emergency fund. But I think you're doing all right, sweetheart. Well, I wouldn't worry about well, it. Well, well, what about you said all, not all pensions are secure? Well, they're not all secure. How but do I you have find a, out if yours is? Yeah, I would, well, if you're working, you, you have to just call your company and say, is anything going on with my pension? Do I have any, is it, are you underfunded? Do you have enough money in here to pay me forever? So I wouldn't worry about it because you see, she also has a lot of retirement investment accounts. So even if one of these stops, she would probably be okay here. Right. So a, a big emergency fund isn't going to help you that much. Great. This is Tony Lockett. I'm glad somebody's doing okay. I'm going to hear so many bad stories. Hi, Susie. I would like to hear more advice for people who are already retired. My husband and I retired in 2003 with a good pension and investments. Then in 2008, we lost half of our investments. Yeah. We are filled with anxiety over what to do with what we have left. We need to supplement our pension and secu Social Security, but we're so afraid of losing what we have left. Please give, give some advice of where people in their 70s should put their money. Thanks for all you do, Susie. Yeah. Here's what I would say. This and is a lot of people's yeah, story. Yeah. Tony, listen to me closely. There, you don't have a lot of choices. You can't put your money in certificates of deposit, they're paying, what, 1%. You can't put your money in treasuries, they're paying, what, a half a percent or 2%. So you can't really have many safe places to put money to generate income. However, with that said, 
there are many, many good quality individual stocks. We've talked about this last time I was on here, whether they're stocks or exchange traded funds that are paying a five or six percent dividend yield. If you're needing income from these investments, you care about the income really more than you do the principal. Because it doesn't matter if you invest in something that has a solid dividend, they're not going to take it away from you. Then you know you're going to get that dividend whether the stock is at 30 or the stock is at 40 or the stock is at 20. So as long as you're getting the income you need, that's all you should care about. So again, in the Money Navigator newsletter that we're going to give all of you free for one year, there is a retirement portfolio that if you simply follow it will generate close to 4.5% in interest for you that's totally diversified. And that's what I would be looking at. However, here was the mistake that you made. You had retired and you had money in, in investments in you know, your money in investments because you thought at the time your Social Security and what? Your pension was enough. You did not take into consideration inflation because if you had, you never would have invested your money to lose it. So you kind of did this to yourself. So you mean it was too risky? It was too risky. So he the had investments good, were Yeah, risky. he had a good pension. He had investments. But then he lost half of his investments. And now they're filled with anxiety. At that point, he should have looked at it and go, how much money can I afford to lose mm -hmm. and still be okay? Right. But he had a lot of it in investments, do you see? Mm -hmm. So be very careful if those investments had been in dividend-paying stocks or exchange-traded funds or bonds or whatever, you wouldn't care if they had gone down half in value because you'd still be getting the income. Right, right. And that's right. all he's missing. That's right, that's right. Yeah, but that's not where he was invested. Right, well, that's good to know for the future. Yeah. Here's Robin Fletcher. I would ask whether 20 or 30-year government CDs are a good long-term investment. I hate Wall Street and its greed. So what else is a good long-term investment? I would not be doing 20 or 30 year treasury bonds. You are locking in some of the lowest interest rates that we have ever had on mm. treasuries for the next 30 years. If interest rates go up, the value of a treasury bond, any bond will go down. So if interest rates go up and she now wants to sell her 20 or 30 year bond, right. she's going to sell it for less right. than what she paid for it. CDs are, are good, but they're also not paying you enough to do anything with. You might want to look into some of your money into TIPS, Treasury Inflation Protected Securities, because I do think that you're going to see inflation come back here in another year or two. You also can look into exchange-traded funds or dividend-paying stocks. You say, I hate Wall Street and it's greed. Just because you hate Wall Street doesn't mean that you can't make money off of Wall Street. <laughs> if you don't make money off of Wall Street, you're never going to have any money. And then they won. Do you understand? They won the game. Because what else are you going to do with this money? If that isn't what you want to do, you need to take whatever money you have and pay down any outstanding debts. So if you have a mortgage, pay down the mortgage. Once the mortgage is paid down, you don't need as much money to generate income because right. you don't have a mortgage. Pay off your credit card debt, your student loan debt. Pay off all of that. Got it? So if you could just simply do that, then you don't need as much money when you've retired. Right. But no, hate isn't going to help you, sweetheart. You don't have to like what's going on, but you can use it to your advantage. Yes. As long as you can trust it. I mean, that's the thing. That's why she hates it. She feels that she can't trust it. Well, she feels like she can't trust anybody who's telling her what to do. Well, she'll trust you, Susie. I hope so. Again, take advantage of the money navigator that we're going to give you. Great. This is from Dan Olson. I'm sure she gets this one a lot, but I wondered if she would still recommend investing in gold and precious metals. Yes, I have to tell you, Dan, I would. I've been a lover of gold. I probably told you last time I was here to put a small part of your portfolio, no more than 10 or 15% into gold. Since that time, gold probably went up to $1,900 an ounce. At then, it went all the way back down to almost $1,500 an ounce. Today, as I sit here in front of you, it's at $1,638 an ounce. I do believe by November of this year, you could see gold at $2,000 to $2,100 an ounce. If you're going to buy gold, the best way to do it is through exchange-traded funds. On um, A week ago, in our Money Navigator portfolio, we added gold for the first time at its low at $1,560 here. So we're up almost $100. Follow what it tells you, and then wow, you don't have to worry great. about it. Wow, that's great. That's yeah. great. 
Well, gold can't really go down, can it? No, gold could go. Remember back in the 80s, gold went all the way up to $800 an ounce, and then it went all the way down to $200 an ounce, and then it stayed there for years and years and years. Sure, it can go down. Oh, yeah. It absolutely can go down. But it's going to come back. It has to come back. Well, it didn't come back for years and years before, so nothing has to do anything anymore, my dear Marlo. But you believe in it for now. Yeah, I believe in it for now. That doesn't mean I'll always believe in it, just so you know. Okay, that's what we want to know. If it's not on your navigator, we're not going to go near it. That's right. <laughs> this is from Michael Engelman. I'm 46 and have no debt. Well, congratulations. And I have about 30000 in a checking account and about 600000 in a brokerage account with a mix of stocks, mutual funds, and cash. I'm about to relocate to Chicago from a small rural area. In the process, giving up a job where I make about 100000 for a job where I'll make about 50000 initially and in a much more expensive city. Are we following this? Okay, yeah, bye, guys. All right with the potential for more with some hard work. Financially, it doesn't make sense, but I'm also gay. Something I've come to deal with late in life, and I need to move somewhere more diverse, mm. where I can live a more full life. I know you say people, money, things, and I think this is probably following that mantra. But now that the change is imminent, I'm freaking out. Am I crazy to do this? Let me say something to you. As you know, it's no secret that I've been gay my entire life. And that while it is easier to live in a place like San Francisco or, you know, here in New York City or places, my residency happens to be Florida. Not the most open place when it comes to that. And I feel totally fine with it. It's one thing when you are freaking out about your sexuality. It's another thing when you are freaking out about your money. Your money goes with you wherever you go and so does your sexuality. If you like where you are living. If you like the job that you have, then I would tell you to stay there. Because, you know, in 1980, when I first became a stockbroker, it wasn't so cool for a woman to be gay working for Merrill Lynch. I was the first woman in the Oakland office, let alone a gay woman. (laughs) But they knew immediately that I was gay, (coughs) and I was so proud to be gay and just be part of it and not even talk about it. I was accepted for who I was without having to go, look at me, I'm gay. So if you or have don't people, look at me, I'm yeah, not gay, yeah. the other one. You know, so, so if you like where you are and you like the money that you're making, just have the people around you love you for who you are. And you can change them. You don't have to change yourself. You just have to love them up. And eventually you'll see it's easy to be gay anywhere and everywhere with a little time and a little patience. So why don't you try that before you move to a more expensive city, less income. Are you kidding me? It's harder to get a job now than just simply be proud that you're gay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and and be honest with the people that I think you may be running away from. Uh, That's You know know. what else, Milo? It's how you tell them. Yeah. If you tell them like you're ashamed of it, Mm -hmm. then they kind of react like, really? Yeah. And then they feel bad for you because they can't sense your power. But if you tell them as if it's the greatest thing in the world that's ever happened, they're happy for you. Right, right. They're happy. The greatest thing that's ever happened to me, people, is that I'm gay, and I knew from the beginning that I was gay. And I also found KT. That was a good good thing. That was a good one. That's that's (laughs) always the reason. Uh, This is Unlisted Zero Zero. Hello, Susie. What happens if you contribute to a Roth IRA then make over the qualification limits? Oops. Yeah. Now, did you contribute to a Roth IRA in the year that you made over the contribution limits? If you did, or the income limits, just take it out and it's not a big deal. If you did it in a year and you made over and you didn't take it out, there is a 6% penalty or something like that. But if you started a Roth IRA when you were in the income limitations, and now the next year you made over those income qualifications, who cares? You can still leave the money in there for as long as you want. It's not that big of a deal. Don't oh, worry good. about it. Oh, yeah. good. This is from Eclipse 65. Susie, my husband and I are in our early 30s. We had a late start financially. We have about 10K in a personal loan, 1500 in a credit card that we hope to pay off when my husband starts bringing in income. He's a commission only and just started his job two months ago. Yeah. And 25K in student loans between the two of us. We have maybe about 80K in our IRA 401K combined. I'm contributing 10% to my 401K and my husband will do the same once he qualifies for a 401K at his job. We would like to save for a house if that is even possible. I make about 75K gross. What can we do to build our lackluster retirement and purchase a home if we can ever even get to have that American dream? How old were these people? 30s. They're in their 30s. So 
you have lots of time, lots of time. So you just need to keep going exactly like you're going. But you shouldn't be using words like lackluster. You shouldn't feel bad about your city. Oh, they're 65. No, no, she's in the early 30s. Oh, that one. Sorry, a different one. Yeah, All right. Yeah. So 35 and you have a late start. Well, at 30, you don't have a late start. Remember, I was a waitress till I was 30 years of age, making $400 a month for seven years. I didn't write my first book till I was 45 years oh, of age. Oh, that's great. So it's not too late. You need to change how you're thinking about your life. So you're young, you're vital, you have years ahead. Stop putting yourself down. So remember, only contribute to your 401k if it matches. Only contribute up to the point of the match in your 401k. Open up Roth IRAs if you qualify for them as well. Start saving for a good down payment on a house. And as, as time goes on, you pay that house off in full. So you can do this. It's, you know, so what if you have a lackluster retire, you know, retirement? You can get there. You just have to dream about who you are. Yeah, don't you? Well, what about even the whole idea of having a house with the American dream? I mean... Well, now what? people can have a house again. Right. You know, if houses continued to go the way they were going, mm -hmm. everybody was priced out of the housing right, market. Right. Now that houses have come down dramatically in certain areas, right. people who never could have owned a home before will probably be able to own a home for the first time. So the American dream, once again, can be rekindled here. That's great. This is from uh, Sean Bagley. As a childless person, it kills me to see my friends throw 50000 a year on their kids' tuition when they can't afford it. And the kid hasn't a clue what they want to do with their education. How can I drive my point home of community college first to prove themselves as well as find their direction before spending 50000 a year? Well, here's what I would do. Good <laughs> luck. Good luck. But I would tell them, you better listen to Susie Orman. Do you know Susie Orman says that's absolutely nuts? that you're spending $50,000 a year on a college education for a child when you yourself don't have eight months of an emergency fund, you don't have a retirement account, your house isn't paid off, what are you going to do? If you think your kids are going to be able to support you when you get older, I'm here to tell you I don't think so. However, here was the deal that I think they should make. If they're putting $50,000 into this kid's education, the kid needs to give their parents back especially if they don't have the money, 10% of their gross salary every single year for the rest of their lives. It's kind of a loan so that the kid takes care of the parents when they start making money and the parents obviously are taking care of the kids. If parents want to take care of the kids, I'm telling you there is nothing that you can do to stop them from doing so. I know, you know, when it comes to kids, I know. it's like, I know. especially moms, <coughs> oh my God, single moms. Now, this is a very uh, specific question, but because a lot of people have lived in areas that, that something yeah. bad happens to, yeah, them, I thought it. we should ask it. You Maybe it could help. So, it's from Tammy Ann. We took a $40,000 plus loss to leave a highly toxic area and move to a tiny condo, which is now also worth 40000 plus less. Home in Katrina area in... Uh, in what do you call Mississippi. it? Mississippi. Mississippi. It's been up for sale four plus years and hubby works three days a week. I'm disabled. Our child has health learning issues. Is there any way to get tax breaks on our losses? We, that, that's pretty much the, yeah. the question. Here's the thing. To get a tax break on your loss, it had to be a rental property. There is no such thing as a loss on a primary property. It's just not there. The government feels that they're already being lenient enough with you that if you owed money on this house, let's say you owed $80,000 and you sold it for $40,000 and you lost money, so did the bank, they're not taxing you on that if it's your primary residency. So I'm sorry to say there isn't a tax situation here, but my question becomes, why is your husband only working three days a week? Now I get you might say there aren't jobs, there's nothing to do. All right, so can he go out and can he be a driver? Can he shop for the elderly? Can he do anything like that? It doesn't have to be a job working for somebody else. This is the time in life now. Let him become entrepreneurial. Like I said, you know, there's lots of people who need rides places and they can't afford a limousine service and they need to go to the airport. Let your husband start that. 
but he's got to become more entrepreneurial because he's got a big thing on his hands. He's got to make sure you're okay as well as the family. I'm so sorry I don't have a better answer for no, you. No, but I mean, this is real life and we have yeah, to... Yeah, it is what know, it is, isn't it? Is, it? it is what it is and it, it helps other people figure these things out. Uh, we, we we're really being asked to stop. So this is from Sandy O. Oh. I, I when I have you Sandy here, I want oh, everybody. Oh, Sandy O. Oh, oh, you post on my Twitter and and Facebook account. I recognize that. Oh, Sandy that's oh, great. Oh. Well, this is your fan, a yes. real fan. She's from Canada, though I believe. Really? Yeah. What's an RRSP? That's what they. That's their retirement plan in Canada. She says, how do you figure out how much you should be putting away each month into your RRSP? So that you can retire and still live relatively the same lifestyle you have now. What's the formula? Here's so that's the formula because I don't know how much you're allowed to put right. in the RRSP. But here's what I would do. I would project out, Sandy, oh, oh, into the future. How much money do you think you are going to need per month to live? You would then multiply that monthly, let's say it's $3,000 or $5,000. And you would multiply $5,000 times 12. That's $60,000. How much do you need in an account so that after taxes, it generates $60,000 a year for you in expenses? So if taxes were to consideration, you would need about $1.5 million at today's interest rates to get that $60,000. So there's formulas that you can use. You can go online, many calculators that will show you how much you should need in retirement. But we answered that for you now, Sandy O.O. Okay, one last question. All right. Piper Lindine, any mm -hmm. tips? Our, our audience loves tips, and you always have great ones. Any tips on getting lower interest rates right now? Lower interest rates on mortgages, on uh, credit cards, uh -huh. on in general, on your <coughs> savings account. I'm going to assume that you mean any tips on getting a lower interest rate on my credit card. Yeah, if you have a credit card with a bank, convert it or try to transfer it to a credit union credit card. Credit union credit cards by law cannot charge you more than 18% interest if they're federally charted. So that's one thing you can do. If you're asking how do I get a lower interest rate on my home, you have to have enough equity in that home and you have to have a good FICO score, you're not going to be able to do it. You don't want to get a lower interest rate on your savings account because no. they're already at 0%. That's right. Yes, right. So, so that's about all I can right. tell you for that one. And this is one mm. we had several of these. I'm not, they're going to kill me. I just want to <clears> take one more from you. Sonia Whitfield Fox. How do you determine if you need a trust or a will is enough? I never think a will is enough. I don't care if you have no money and let me tell you why. If all you have is a will, a will is simply a document that says where your assets are to go upon your death. Okay, not the most cost efficient type of document to get them there, but they'll get there. But what if you don't die? Here's my question to you, Sonia. What if all of a sudden you have a stroke or you're in an accident or something happens to you and you're all by yourself, all you have is a will, a will isn't going to say who's going to pay your checks for you, how are you going to pay bills, mm. all the, who's going to take care of you financially speaking. A living revocable trust that has an incapacity clause in it. Mm -hmm. You can name yourself as the trustee while you're healthy, but then you can name your mother or your friend a successor trustee. So if something happens to you and you're incapacitated, it immediately takes effect and you'll be okay. So every one of you needs a living revocable trust with an incapacity clause in it. Wonderful. Susie, our audience loves your tips. They are so helpful. So we have two we need today. One is three tips for managing student loans. Yeah, the number one tip really for managing a student loan is to please pay them. Make it your number one priority. You manage your future of your life by managing the money you owe. And again, I cannot say this enough. Student loans in most cases are not dischargeable in bankruptcy. So therefore, you have to pay them. Now, Let's say you're in a job, you don't know how to pay these off, but you're in a public service job. Guess what? Those student loans could be gone in 10 years, so check out all the rules and regulations because if you're doing something public service after 10 years, student loans are gone. And if you're in a situation where you really can't pay off these student loans, go and figure out and make sure that you've consolidated them all under the income-based method to repay it. And that way it might lower your payment and that's a good thing for you to do. Uh, listen, I know it's not easy, but you know when you have a check, if you're writing a check every month to the student loan company, you know where it says pay to the order of, just simply put on top of that, I'm happy to. So at least feel good about the student <laughs> that's loan. That's great. That's All right. Great. Now, three tips for paying off credit card debt. Listen to me. The very first tip is this. You have got to stand in your truth. 
You have got to look at your credit card bills. You have got to open them up. You have got to put them in order from the highest interest rate to the lowest. And you have got to face the reality that you have been living a financial lie. It will not do me any good to tell you how to get out of credit card debt if you do not fix the situation as to why you got in credit card debt to begin with. Mainly, people who feel less than spend more than. So you have got to stand in your truth and face what do you owe. Next, ready for this one? You have to tell every single person you know how much credit card debt you have. Oh, wow. You should even go to strangers and say, guess what? I have $30,000 of credit card debt. Aren't I great? Why do I want you to tell everybody that you know in particular that you have credit card debt? That way they know when they ask you to go to dinner, they ask you to go on a vacation, they ask you to go to the movies, they ask you to go to the shopping mall with them, they ask you to do things that cost money. Now you have the freedom to say, why are you asking me to do these things? You know I have $30,000 right, in credit card debt. I can't afford it. Then they'll stop asking you. When they stop asking you, you no longer have that enticement and you feel guilty about it. Right. And hey, if you have credit card debt and they want to pay for you and they're not in credit card debt, they have the option to do so. So that's why I want you to tell everybody that you have credit card debt so you can start to turn this around. And the last tip is this. You always should pay more than the minimum payment due on your credit cards. We've talked about this before, so if, you, if your minimum payment due is $50, make that by three. Pay $150 a month. If you pay more than the minimum, your credit card debt will go away faster than you have any idea. If you only pay the minimum, it will stay around forever. So stand in your root, tr So stand in your truth. Tell everybody you know you have credit card debt and always pay more than the minimum, and you'll be a rockin' and a rollin' with us. Well, we're out of time. We've been out of time. But I, when I have her here, I get so greedy for all of her <laughs> answers and her energy. And I know how much it's helping every one of you. And I'm learning from every one of these, too, myself. So that's why I get so excited to, add, to have her answer them all. Susie, come back and come I, back. Well, I just want back. to tell all of you, watch the Oprah Winfrey Network, the Money Class, America's Money Class, every Monday night on the Oprah Winfrey Network. Check it out. You might be able to win $50,000. Oh, wow. I know. How exciting. Yeah. So what do you, we have a, was there a contest? There is a contest. Watch every single month, every single week for the next five weeks. The, the, the other one, the first one was just a few days ago. And what can happen? You just go on after the sixth exam. You, after the sixth class, you take an exam. You have 24 hours to do so. And then what happens to you? Guess what? If you pass it, then you're entered in a contest that can win. And KT is kind of sneaking this up because oh, good, good. Yeah, the Money Class book just came out in softback. I think the first time I was yeah. here, I was here when it was in I hardback. Know. Number one New York Times I watched color. the CD on this. It was yeah. fabulous. This is a great thing, so you might want to check it out. And for those of you who want to know more about prepaid debit cards, go to theapprovedcard.com. Check out the debit card that I just brought to market. But more than anything... Just stay involved with your money. Keep watching us together. That's Don't you right. think we make a I cute know. couple? <laughs> yeah, we're like those little dogs in the scotch ass. Uh, so glad that you were here today. Thanks so much. And we're going to have Susie back very soon. Bye-bye.